Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. Russian President Vladimir Putin's declaration of victory over terrorist elements in Syria and his demanded shift of focus to a political course has been met by the United States with skepticism, as Washington argues that Putin's declaration of a so-called triumph against the Islamic State was premature. Nevertheless, international aspirations to pursue a political process between the Syrian government and opposition has proven increasingly challenging amid clear successes on the ground by the Assad regime. To further discuss the latest development, I'm joined here in the studio by Dr. Mordechai Kedar, who is a Middle East expert at Bar Ilan University. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like also to welcome our TV7 analyst, Mr. Amir Oren, and Dr. Eran Lerman, who is the Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies and a lecturer at Shalem College. Welcome. Mr. Oren, give us a broader understanding of the current situation. In a couple of months, uh, we are going to mark the uh, seven years of uh, Syrian civil war, which started in early uh, 2011. And within this period, we had three years of uh, war against the Islamic State. In Iraq too, but uh, for that matter, in Syria. This war is now winding down, whether uh, total victory can be declared or whether it is a bit uh, premature. And uh, the uh, test, which is uh, yet uh, to be over for Syria, is translating what happens on the ground to a political process, a political outcome uh, in the negotiating table. And uh, Vladimir Putin, as you stated in your introduction, has first priority over this process. Uh, Dr. Kedal, there are two processes ongoing. Of course, the one is led by Russia, which uh, in coordination with the Islamic Republic of Iran and Turkey is trying to establish some kind of a de-escalation platform that would initiate some kind of political process through a People's Congress that would establish a more stable Syria that would allow the various actors to actually uh, negotiate or discuss ways to de-escalate uh, de and uh, set up some kind of functioning society. And on the other hand, we have the United Nations broker talks at uh, the Geneva, uh, which are quite on a stalemate for quite some time, with the government not really seeing a lot of interest in negotiating with an opposition group or groups that are keen on seeing a transition of uh, power by President Bashar Assad rather than actually coming to the table and discussing with them on core principles that are based on the reality on the ground. How do you see and perceive the current situation where those two different courses of action are actually quite contradictory to each other? Well, as important as the elements which you just mentioned, I think that uh, we are already now in the next phase of the Syrian future, which is actually the division of the powers between the government of Bashar and the Kurds in the Northeast, the Russians on the shore, the Iranians in the center in the east, uh, and maybe some other groups like Hezbollah who also want to have their presence on Syria. And now we actually see how people are, are phrasing the agreements which will give every party some part of the sovereignty of Syria. And this is what now we are seeing, that Bashar tries to grab as much as he can. Uh, after all, he was given by the others who were invited not to govern Syria, but to get rid of the jihadists, and they did it. Okay, now who will harvest the victory? Will he do it as he wanted all the time, or will they do it by taking parts of the sovereignty and the space uh, as well, uh, because they didn't come, uh, because there is no free lunch. Mm -hmm. Means they came for, for a reason. And now if this is the struggle which we see today. Dr. Lerman? First of all, um, you know, we are looking at the ruins of Aleppo, a city of millions reduced to rubble. Uh, much of the uh, Mad Damascus, at least. Uh, the well, outline, part of Aleppo. Uh, that's uh, more very of the large parts of Aleppo. Western part, yeah. And uh, large parts of the Damascus countryside, uh, mm. the reef, Ruta, Ruta have been uh, laid to rubble. The majority of Syrians no longer live, have a home, and probably a third of Syrians are outside Syria. The interest of the international community, of course, is to create a process that will enable them to go home. They will not go home 
to uh, to Assad's no regime. Homes. There is no home, and they will not go home to Assad's mm -hmm. regime. So, whatever the Russians and the Turks and the Iranians are able to agree on in the Astana process, doesn't end the Syrian conflict. Moreover, I have a feeling that uh, while IS could be militarily defeated uh, and has been more or less obliterated, to actually hold the Sunni areas of Syria uh, for a prolonged period of time is not going to be that easy for a Syrian military that has been badly mauled. So they, yes, they continue to rely on some Iranian presence, on Hezbollah presence, but uh, for, the for example, the Turks, I don't think, will uh, acquiesce in the northern Sunni area of Idlib being run over. So the landscape is still quite divided. So you would agree, uh, Mr. Oren, that uh, Putin's declaration of victory over the extreme Muslim uh, elements or the various terrorist elements was premature indeed? Well, Putin uh, obviously is uh, considering his own domestic audience. Uh, he's uh, trying to get reelected. Uh, it's going to be a fair election. The Russians are not going to meddle in the Russian election. So uh, he has his work cut out for him. And he wants to have uh, at least the appearance of his forces starting to go home. He said uh, it doesn't matter. He can make do with whatever force is uh, staying there and also reap the political benefit of announcing that he's going home. So uh, victory is not uh, a real part of it. Uh, it's, it's a slogan. But uh, on the other side, you, you see the Americans. And uh, here, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense Mattis is important because he is the former commanding general of the Central Command. And he has learned the lesson of a premature retreat from Iraq, which uh, uh, led the uh, uh, Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula uh, in its new disguise as uh, uh, ISIS, um, get all of these territories in Iraq and in Syria. They are not going to leave that soon if Matis has his way. And therefore, um, he said that in order for the political process um, to get uh, into track, one must um, ensure that the remnants of uh, the Islamic State do not recover, and therefore an American military presence is necessary. Dr. Kedan? Well, I think that uh, Bashar and his allies, especially the Iranians and Hezbollah, are trying to make sure that there will never be any ISIS kind of an organization in Syria. After all, don't forget, it, this is only the second round. The first round was in the 76, and, and uh, between 76 and 82 means the Sunni majority is the problem because every generation, we passed 30 years from the or 40 years, means it could happen in 30 years again when the population, the Sunni population, recovers from the war and the new generation comes and start the war again. In order to prevent it, they, as much as I understand, they are trying now to change the population, to bring Shia from Iraq, from Iran, from Pakistan, from Afghanistan, wherever they can bring Shia, in order to replace the Sunni majority, which was, or at least parts of it. After all, many of them ran away. Uh, half of the population are refugees, either inside Syria, running from place to place, running away from the bombs and so forth, or outside in Europe, in Jordan, in Turkey, in Lebanon, in many other countries as well. So now it's the time to replace the population to a population which will be more, a, a more peaceful with the Alawi regime, which is, as everybody knows, not even Muslim. They are infidels. This is actually uh, mm. touching based on something that I oh, find yes. quite interesting. Uh, the El Shabi or the mobilization forces in Iraq have stated on several occasions that the moment they'll uh, complete their task of defeating the Islamic State in Iraq, they will move back, uh, some of them being Syrians, but also others from uh, other parts of the world coming together to fight alongside the Assad forces that has uh, been retracted at some point, or not retracted, but a different statement came out in which they vowed to return all the ha heavy weaponry in their possession towards the central government in Baghdad. Do you believe that those forces nevertheless will 
continue to fight and will enter the uh, Syria arena in order to establish a more powerful dominance considering their patron Iran having still strategic and uh, most significant interest in Syria? Well, the general question is where, what, how far will the Iranians go in pushing for, to, for hegemony in Syria? Uh, and of course, the, the decisions of al Hashd al-Shaabi uh, ultimately subject to the veto power, so to speak, of Qasem Soleimani, who has been basically the recruiting agent and, and, uh, and organizer uh, in Iraq. Uh, the Iraqi government is getting a bit edgy because uh, they, they have been, they, there had been uh, offers by the Saudis that would restrain their level of commitment to the Iranians. And I think they, they, there, is a, there is a game going on within Iraqi Shia as how far are they willing to take risks on behalf of Iran. Having said all this, uh, the main question ultimately is what kind of relationship is going to emerge between Assad and his Iranian co-sponsors? In other words, whether there is ultimately a difference between Russian interests and Iranian interests, and who would Assad listen to at the end of the day? My gut instinct is that much as he owes the Iranians, he owes the Russians more. It is the Russians who made the difference on, at the end of the day in the, in the uh, trajectory of events from 15, uh, 2015 onwards. And if the Russians tell him to, to be very easy on how, he com how much he is willing to commit to the Iranians, notwithstanding that they, you know, they told us to uh, uh, forget about getting the Iranians out. Um, I'm not surprised. But there is a smaller set of Israeli uh, requirements on Iranian, the Iranian presence in Syria that the Russians could live with, which is to make sure that they don't hold the south, that they don't uh, encroach on Jordan, that they do not establish a Hezbollah base on the Golan frontier. I Jordan is also demanding the same things. Yes, yes. Uh, the Jordanians and the Americans and the Russians signed this uh, memorandum of understanding that uh, I believe was also, uh, let's say, uh, made uh, familiar to us uh, in the process. Mm -hmm. Mr. Owen? Um, the Iranian uh, uh, foothold in, in Syria is not uh, only a minus for Israel. The Iranians would have something to lose if um, it flares up. Israel would have a target, an Iranian target, outside of uh, Iran's territory if it wants to strike an Iranian target. So uh, strategically, it may uh, balance uh, out. Now, uh, earlier, um, before 2015, before the Russian intervention, when we talked about the division of Syria following the civil war, we usually meant uh, to districts or cantons uh, along ethnic and other lines. But now it seems as if the division of Syria would be uh, from north to south with the western strip, the coastal strip being held by the Russians. And this also happens to be the stronghold of the Assad Alawite uh, uh, supporters. And the central and eastern parts could be left for others, uh, the Iranians, the militias uh, coming from Iraq and other places. Uh, for Israel, this would not be a good result. Dr. Kedar, I'd like to touch base on the political aspects of uh, the interests of Damascus, of course, uh, to reassert their control all over the country. Of course, uh, there's still the SDF alliance that has a strong foothold in uh, somewhat of the northeastern parts of uh, Syria and elsewhere as well, where they're uh, still quite uh, powerful, but with uh, not uh, little challenges at hand considering uh, Washington's withdrawal of their key support, uh, providing them with heavy weaponry and changing them to more policing uh, aspects and tactical assistance. Uh, do you believe that Assad has actually... Uh, a point of interest to negotiate with the opposition or does the opposition have actually any kind of leverage considering their weak aspects currently on the ground in Syria? No, we, we definitely we see that he doesn't even want to meet them. Uh, in, uh, even is either in Astana or in, in wherever, wherever he has a meeting, he, he has to be forced to meet them. 
usually by the Russians who do want to listen. So he, he himself, if it was left for him, he wouldn't, he wouldn't even talk to them. This is the mindset of this region. In Russia, it is a bit different, it's a culture. However, for Israel, as you asked, I think that Israel has two interests. One is to keep the Iranians as far as possible. And Israel apparently drew a line, which is like 40 kilometers from Israel. Maybe this is one thing. And the other thing is to make sure that the Druze community of both the Hermon uh, mountain and Sweda area are intact. This is, in my view, a red line for Israel because of the relations here in, inside Israel between the government and the state and the Druze community here in, inside Israel. And many are connected, family ties and so forth. I think that if these two issues, the keeping the Iranians away and keeping the Druze safe, I think that Israel could live with any other uh, 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 constellation. In, in the solution of, of Syria, because it's far from us and we don't really want to mess with uh, two heavy things in Syria. I'll return to the Israeli uh, angle of this uh, conflict soon, but I'd like to touch base again on the negotiations. Uh, Dr. Lerman, when uh, Bashar al-Jafari, the Syrian ambassador to the United Nations, uh, was sent by the Assad uh, regime to Geneva to discuss or to have a delegation uh, representing Assad uh, in front of uh, Staffan de Mistura, the UN envoy to Syria, and uh, also to discuss uh, the various angles with the opposition. He very quickly came to terms with realizing that there is no other side or there is no other partner, as we like in Israel to state mm -hmm. so often, uh, with regard to establishing some kind of a political process that would bring about a viable solution to that uh, uh, challenging uh, country. Uh, do you believe that the Syrians have some kind of interest or the Syrian government has some kind of interest to sit with an opposition that just recently wasn't even united in its efforts to bring about such a solution? Well, quite frankly, the, this is all a piece of fiction. Um, the opposition that comes to Geneva, essentially a Saudi-sponsored uh, group of people with very limited leverage on the ground in Syria, um, can serve as a, a bit of decoration for a process in which Assad consolidates his power if they decide to submit, but they will not be able to deliver much on the ground. The real power on the ground, not that uh, now that IS has been crushed, are uh, Jabhat al-Nusra largely in some parts, particularly in the north, uh, by the Turkish border, and the Turks are playing, as usual, a double, triple, quadruple game. Uh, and uh, S the SDF, uh, and, and there's a question of when will they, what, for how much longer the Americans will stay, because as long as they stay in, uh, in, in eastern Syria, ath uh, athwart the Iranian arc, uh, there, is a, there is a kind of uh, limiting f uh, factor in the ability of Assad to retake the whole country. But the people they meet in, in Geneva cannot deliver uh, on the ground, and the people on the ground have no interest uh, in, in coming to Geneva, and they've been ruled out by the Russians and the Syrians as interlocutors. So uh, the political process strikes me essentially as a way for the Russians to pretend that the brutal submission of Syria and its ethnic cleansing, if I go along with Moti's analysis, um, has some kind of legitimacy through a negotiated process. One, one, has, one has to give the um, Assad dynasty some credit. Of course, uh, the means they chose were and still are brutal. But uh, if you go back to the 50s and 60s, you had uh, Zaim and Kuwatli and Shishakli and many other rulers, and then uh, Jantas, uh, Ba'ath and otherwise, until Hafez Assad came to power in November of 1970, ruled for 30 years, then uh, was replaced uh, by Bashar. So it's 47 years already that the Bashar family has been in power. And uh, when they are gone, uh, Syria will be destabilized again, much like Iraq after Saddam Hussein, um, another dictator, 
uh, was defeated by the United States and left the scene, and we haven't seen a stable Iraq ever since. So one is not certain whether those outside powers who speak about um, Assad, the war criminal, and the need uh, to put him on trial, whether they really mean it. He is a very useful servant or um, emissary for them. Dr. Kedal? Well, you can add to the 47 years, another four years of Salah Jadid, who was also um, a, 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 an Alawite. And if you really want, you can add some more years since 63, since the Ba'ath. Uh, I mean, was, Hafez. I mean, yeah. right, the, 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 not the military, the civil bath. Ah. And since Jadid came to power, so definitely we're talking about more than 50 years that the bath slash Alawi uh, are with our controlling Syria. However, uh, uh, they definitely succeeded to remain in power. And don't forget that the Alawis are more or less 10% of the population, the original population of Syria. Today, they might be a bigger percentage because the others... Uh, the others ran away. Uh, this does not, means what, what happened in the last seven years does not give them more legitimacy. Because all those remnants of the Sunni communities in Syria, now, not only they don't see them that illegitimate, now they have also a blood revenge. The Belgian class. The blood revenge, because here you, there is almost no family without a brother, a cousin, who got killed for the last seven years. And this, I think, will bring the country to even worse dictatorship uh, compared to what it was uh, beforehand, before, before the war, because of the bad feelings inside, inside the population or the remnants of the population. And this is why I don't see in, the, in the, any horizon any loosening of the grip. Uh, and this, uh, don't forget, when you have a, 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 a very heavy grip on the throats of people, you actually push them to continue fighting and to continue terrorism and to continue to, to, continue to resist against the regime. This is why, as much as we can talk about victory and so forth, it does not mean peaceful uh, state as it will be now. Don't forget the destruction. Now we have to start to rebuild the country. Who will build it? Who will be? Will they be the well, Iranians? The Russians, they don't have that kind of resources. Dr. Lehman? Well, the Russians are an important player here, of course, obviously, and they have now secured a big prize, which is a naval base in the Mediterranean uh, on a scale and of, of, uh, of capacities that Tartus did not have before. This is very significant, among other things, I'm just I'm familiar with an explanation I've heard once from uh, Yash Kedmi, who knows the stuff, uh, that uh, in the agreements in Europe, the Russians uh, limited themselves to, uh, on certain categories, that the Americans have a board ship. So the Russians need um, warm water bases to place some of their counterpunch capabilities and therefore, this Tartus business is extremely important to them. Interestingly enough, I think this generates a common interest between Israel and Russia with all the very, very uh, cautious way I'm saying it. Ultimately, our, Russia is not our friend. And uh, their friends are our enemies right now. But at the end of the day, it so happens that our interests will coincide in one respect. Syria will now have to concentrate on, recon on, on reconstructing what's left on the eastern part of uh, western part of Syria that, that is Assad's land uh, to rebuild the, the ruins and try to keep the place in one piece under an iron hand. Any further adventurism, which is what Khamenei would like them to take them into, would risk losing everything that they've achieved with so much blood and, and, and treasure spent. So and to fulfill one, one this element, which we should bear in mind, is the gas, the Syrian gas in the sea, which, in, in, as much as I read, it's more than what Israel has. It has significant. I think quantity. that the Russians will have some uh, monopoly on this gas as a reward for what they did for Syria, and you know, after all, Russia today is one of the three major uh, exporters of uh, of gas natural gas, Iran and Qatar are the others. And this way will, will enable Russia to remain as a major player in the gas market of the world. I'd like to uh, come to a po uh, point of uh, 
our ultimate question, and that is, should Damascus go on the course of a political process or should it continue perce- uh, pursuing a military option that would eventually reach uh, its ultimate goal of reasserting its dominance in Syria, Mr. Owen? Uh, the two are intertwined because uh, the political solution must reflect the reality on the ground, but the reality uh, on the ground must also take into consideration the parameters of any possible political solution. Otherwise, as was mentioned here, people will have their backs to the wall and will go on fighting and there will be um, no uh, real uh, viability to any political solution. What uh, is going on now, whether it's Astana, Sochi, uh, Geneva, is that the various parties must converge, must give up the wildest dreams and um, perhaps there is no uh, single opposition figure to serve as the senior uh, uh, member of an Assad uh, unity government, uh, funny as this uh, name uh, could sound, a unity government, but they must get their act together, otherwise we are in for a long, long conflict. Dr. Kedo? Well, in the Middle East, maybe some other parts of the world as well, maintaining power and politics are actually two sides of the same uh, coin of statementship. Dr. Lerman? I actually think that uh, the the Syrian military, despite the recent gains, is more fragile and stretched out than uh, right meets the eye right right now. And to sustain long-term control over the entire country is probably beyond their capacity. Therefore, I wouldn't be surprised if the political process takes the form of uh, uh, what they call in Arabic la marquazia, a certain degree of decentralization. Uh, For example, uh, an arrangement with the SDF in Rojava, an arrangement with a a Sunni element in Idlib that would uh, enable them to sort of nod their head to Assad as if he runs the place, but will absorb the Syrian military from the need to actually take it house for house uh, against Turkish, potential Turkish opposition because the Turks have no wish to see millions more being pushed over them. Mm. And uh, in the south, the the Druze and so on, we may see uh, what will emerge in Syria as a less centralized form of government. Plus plus de facto security zones uh, in the north Turkey, in the south Jordan, southwest Israel. Well, we're drawing near to the end of the program, so I'd like to give each and every one of you a closing sentence, not more. Dr. Kedal? Well, I wish the Syrians to regain their country, their peace as as big as it looks today, uh, because we Israelis, I think, we don't like to see bloodshed uh, so close so close to us. Dr. Lerman? Yeah, I think we should never lose sight of the moral aspect. I mean, even if we say that we have we can have an understanding with the Russians, we can live with Assad persisting in Syria. We should not let go of the moral revulsion, what we've been seeing over the last six years. Uh, ISIS is off the books for now, but I wouldn't exclude the possibility that if the four of us meet here next year, in December of 2018, we will still be talking about the war in Syria. Well, hopefully that won't come to that, but uh, this is all the time that we have for today. So I'd like to thank Dr. Kedal, Mr. Oren, and Dr. Lerman for coming here today. And I'd like to thank our viewers as well, and we will see you next time. TV7 Israel's mission is to give you, our viewers, truthful information, which in effect will give you a chance to really understand what is happening in Israel and its region. If you are blessed by our programs and believe our mission to be important, we urge you to support us and become a voice for Israel. You can support us by going to our website at tv7israelnews.com. This program was made possible through your donations.